Good morning, all. Um, yesterday, we have a very good session chaired by uh, Professor Ikram that set a very, very high standard uh, discussed about the uh, innovations uh, strategy to increase the uh, red pump, uh, to increase the uh, date productions in, um, uh, in general. And then earlier on this morning, we have uh, Slim Aluni chair another session, talk about the connectivity, talk about the communications, and uh, how to connect, uh, how to um, enable the IoT technology that is being deployed into um, the so-called smart farm. And it's quite relevant to what uh, this topic about. And this session, essentially, we are going to talk about the um, fully autonomous red palm weaver detections. So that is the insect that destroys a lot of palm tree, not only in this country and in our uh, part of the world. And also, uh, we'll discuss a little bit about the uh, smart dates farm management and how we're going to do so. And we'll talk about uh, the, um, the biodiversity uh, for the dead palm industry. And then talk about the, um, we have panel to talk about uh, the diversity of the uh, uh, dead palms. And also, we'll roll into um, the technology that we already deployed in uh, this kingdom. Then, um, Dr. Menkin, uh, Richard, Dr. Uh, Richard Menkin is going to talk about the um, dead palm uh, and also the red palm weaver. Uh, technology that's being developed in USDA, the United States uh, Department of Agriculture. Then uh, we will then um, roll into uh, other discussions. For a new audience, I'd like to go through a very, very brief, some of the statistics that uh, many of you uh, know. Um, we talk about a very, very big numbers uh, for the global uh, productions of dates. We have 12. Uh, 120 million of palm trees all over the world. And uh, we're talking about very big number of 2 billion product uh, worth uh, from this industry. And in the kingdom, um, we also talk about almost every single um, individual in the kingdom own a palm tree because we have about 33 million palm trees in the kingdom. And also, um, we know that the population is about 35 million. So essentially, it's a huge number that we're talking about and generating a lot of revenue for the kingdom. Um, the specifically for the topic of the red palm beaver, uh, talk about the global uh, infestations of red palm beaver, starting uh, in uh, Asia, I believe it's India, and then now uh, spreading quite fast uh, to many countries globally. Um, the loss due to the red palm beaver uh, very much talking about 60 countries all over the world and uh, millions of dollars of the um, the the palm, the um, revenue loss and affecting many people life as well. So panelists, we have Dr. Morel Gross uh, Bolt Hazard from um, the from France. Um, she will talk. She will talk about the biodiversity and diversity as well as the origin of date uh, in. Aula. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Morao is very familiar with Saudis because uh, you've been collaborating with the Royal Commission for Aula for quite a number of years and has been doing a lot of research in this region. Um, the second speaker is um, Mr. Abdulmunim Al Sawar, or uh, Swam Mewar, and he's going to talk about uh, technology that is being implement implemented, as mentioned earlier on. And then we have a third speaker, a uh, very, very distinguished uh, researcher and engineer uh, and scientist uh, for red palm beaver and uh, all those different type of technology detections. He's going to uh, tell us about the machine learning methods and based on the acoustics method that he and his team developed in uh, USDA. Then uh, last but, but not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Islam Asri. From Kaos is going to talk specifically about the technology that we co-developed together with Mewa team on the distributed acoustic sensor. Without further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker, Dr. Morel, um, Cross Bao Hazard, uh, to address us. So this is it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good 
morning, everyone. Uh, Salam alaikum. Um, it's my pleasure to be here uh, today. I guess I'm a bit of an outlier because I'm not working on the red palm weevil, but on the origins of um, date palm. So as Boone just said, I'm a research scientist uh, in France, but I'm also a visiting scholar at New York University Abu Dhabi, where I have been working for uh, several years. Uh, my research focuses on the origins and evolution of date palm in general, and today I will more specifically talk about uh, my work in the oasis of Alaula in Saudi Arabia. So the oasis of Alaula um, is located in the northwest of the uh, country. It is a millennia-old oasis, and it's located at the crossroads of uh, civilization. Uh, it has been the place of uh, various uh, civilizations that have all uh, stamped uh, the regions with uh, various uh, uh, cultures, and uh, they leave like amazing archaeological um, remains. Um, so, for instance, during the first millennium BCE, we had the ancient North Arabian uh, kingdoms, and then it was followed by the Nabatean kingdoms, and then uh, during the 7th century, um, this is the beginning of the Islamic uh, period. So obviously, in the Anol Oasis, and in the Oasis of Alaula in particular, um, the main uh, species is uh, the date palm, Phoenix dactylifera. So it's basically the keystone species of um, the Oasis. And uh, beyond uh, being a millennia-old uh, heritage and an essential part of the economy, it's also very important for the subsistence of uh, the local people. So as you may know, the oasis of Alola is under a very dynamic uh, development um, as part of Vision 2030. Um, this is led by the Royal Commission of uh, Alola, and the goal is basically to make uh, the oasis of Alola as uh, an amazing touristic destination for culture, heritage, um, and ecotourism. And so the goal um, to do that, um, it requests obviously a sustainable uh, development, and to do that, um, we need an accurate assessment of the agrobiodiversity richness of the date palm, since they are the main species of the oasis. So agrobiodiversity is a major asset um, for current challenges uh, faced by local societies. It represents a fundamental resource for adapting agriculture to local and uh, global changes. Just like a side uh, note on that, uh, you may know that there is a red palm weevil and some varieties are sensitive, some are less sensitive, and so it's very important um, to conserve and valorize this diversity if we want to face these values and challenges. So um, this is why with my colleague, uh, Dr. Batesti, we have set up the Alula Date Palm Agrobiodiversity Project. And uh, the goal is basically to address both the biological and the social uh, dimensions together in order to properly describe the agrobiodiversity of date palm um, in Alola. So there are two uh, main uh, objectives. Um, the first one is to evaluate the richness of date palm variety. Uh, what we want to uh, see is uh, what different types of palm grove uh, there are in uh, Alola, what is the number of date palm varieties, how is uh, this amazing heritage uh, perpetuated, both socially and technically, and finally, what is the structure of the diversity in the oasis. The second objective is to infer the origins of date palm uh, cultivation. So basically, we would like to know when uh, the date palm was first cultivated in uh, the oasis of Alola, what are the origins of um, this gene pool, how did the diversity evolve in relation to the various kingdoms I've introduced um, earlier today, and finally, how does the modern cultivation techniques have affected the diversity. So to do that, we are taking um, an integrative approach, uh, combining different uh, disciplines. So obviously, we are doing a lot of fieldwork. Uh, we have accumulated um, over the last four years more than six months of fieldwork in the oasis. That's um, the time when we do ethnobotany, meaning that we uh, go uh, in the oasis, we visit the farms, we discuss with the farmers about the varieties that they have, what they think about each of them, uh, what are the different types of uh, groves, and so on. And then we sample plenty of, uh, of palms and we do um, genomics. That's the main, that's the core stuff of the, of the project. And for the second part, the, the objective of the reconstructing the origins of date palm in Alola, we also work on the ancient uh, samples, so basically on archaeological remains that have been discovered in, uh, in Alola. And I will explain that uh, a bit more. So um, regarding the ethnobotanical survey, so here you have a 
a picture of Dr. Battesti interviewing a farm manager uh, in Alola. So that's basically what we <laughs> what we do every day when we are in the in the field meeting plenty of uh, of farmers. So as I mentioned, we have accumulated over six months of field work since 2019 uh, and the onset of the project. And we have um, interviewed more than 100 uh, farm owners and farm managers. Um, on the right, you have uh, what we have found in terms of different palm growth types. So that's the first result I would like to show today. Um, so on the top, uh, you can see the old palm groves. Um, so these are basically palm groves where you have a large amount of varieties of date palms, and you have also um, crops that are growing uh, underneath those palms. And these are basically the groves that are found in the core um, area of the um, oasis. Uh, below, you have the more recent uh, palm groves, uh, where you have less varieties, obviously, and mostly um, the elite uh, varieties. And those palms are rather like uh, um, uh, growing on a grid, and you don't have any crops uh, growing uh, beneath the, the palms. And finally, the last type of palm groves that we have identified in Alala region is the Bedouin palm groves. So those groves are scattered in the desert. Not They are not found in the oasis. They are scattered in the in the desert, um, basically like uh, mostly uh, gro uh, growing in wadis. And so they are characterized by the very little investment. So basically the they do, they mostly come uh, to the groves for the harvest. They don't like cut the palms, they don't pollinate, or sometimes they do, but like not much. It's very, very little investment compared to what we found in the old and uh, recent palm groves in the, in the oasis itself. So now, um, what uh, I would like to emphasize today is that we have uh, identified an exceptional uh, richness of variety in the oasis of Alola. So basically, we have identified 105 names of varieties uh, in this oasis. So some of those varieties are local, uh, for instance, the very famous uh, Barni, and some are exotic, like the Majdul that is originally from uh, Morocco. So in, the, um, in those um, different types of palm groves, we have found two main varieties. This is the Barni and the Helwa. And so these two varieties are the main ones that are found um, in the new palm groves and also kind of in the old palm groves. And they are basically the only two that we have identified in the um, Bedouin palm groves. So the good news is, as I mentioned, agrobiodiversity is a richness. And so the good news is that despite these two varieties are the main one, we still have a lot of other varieties. And in most farms, we have identified that uh, farmers maintain other varieties that are quite rare. Uh, for instance, for some varieties, we have found only one or two uh, farms in the oasis that are left. OK, so now the next uh, question that we are trying to answer is what lie behind those names in terms of genetic identity. So this is what I mean by genetic identity. So based on our previous work in the oasis of uh, Siwa in Egypt, we have identified that a variety, so a name, for instance, Medjul, Halas, or, or whatever, may sometimes be a cultivar, meaning that under this name, you have a single genetic identity because the palm is only clonally propagating uh, using the offshoots that grow at the base of the tree. But sometimes a name does not refer to a cultivar. Sometimes a name may rather refer to what we call a local category. So local category, um, they basically um, gather together several individuals that grow from seeds. And so obviously those individuals, they are different uh, genetically speaking, right? And so the main categories that is known in the oasis is the docker, the, ma the males. And also you have the categories, for instance, for the females that are called the saer. And there are also like different types of, um, of local categories. And so interestingly, you have also the ethno varieties. Um, that's a name that we have uh, coined based on this work that we've done in Siwa, because we have basically identified varieties, so names, where you have a situation in between the cultivar and the local uh, categories, meaning that you have a bit of diversity under the name, but the lineages are mostly propagated um, clonally uh, using the offshoot, but still you have diversity. And obviously, this has a huge implication for the assessment of genetic diversity. If you consider that a name is necessarily a cultivar, and if you are wrong because you have local categories and you have ethnomerities, you may underestimate the diversity. And again, the diversity is our richness to face the challenges of the future. And so it's very important to properly 
assess it and to check for each variety, whether it's a cultivar, a local category, or et an ethno variety. <coughs> and so that's basically what we, are, what we have been doing. So, so far we have uh, only focused on the elite variety uh, Barney. So one thing that is interesting with this variety Barney is that Barney is only the name of the palm. In the market, you won't see any barley dates. I'm sure you have, you've never seen barley dates, or maybe the barley from Oman, but it's completely different from the barley that we have in Alola. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the dates, they are called under different names, depending on the quality of uh, the dates. So in the market, most of the time, you will see the dates that are called mabroom. These are the like VIP dates that you will harvest from uh, the barley palm. And then the second variety, the mushroom, are the dates that are okay still, you can eat them. And then finally, you have the dates that are called adi, and this one, uh, they are just like given to the, to the animals, or just like you don't really use them, you don't um, sell them. And so I mentioned earlier that under a name, you may have a diversity, but it's also interesting to see that for one palm, you have also a, di a diversity of name, and so that's the other way around, right? Okay, so uh, be then the next thing that we have done with this uh, variety uh, Barney is to try to see the genetic identity behind this name. So what we have done is that we have sampled 22 Barney across the different types of palm, gro palm groves that I've just shown uh, earlier in the oasis of Alola, also one in uh, Raibar oasis, and also what you can see in purple is um, in the Bedouin palm grove, so outside of the oasis of Alola. <coughs> so we have sampled those trees, we have done some, uh, so by sample, I mean like taking some uh, leaves, right? Uh, we have done DNA extraction and sequencing and performed some bioinformatic analysis to check what is behind this name, uh, Barney. So these are the results of our different analysis. So we have done uh, kinship statistics, principal component analysis, and a distance tree. I'm not gonna detail all those, um, those uh, results, but feel free to read the paper if you're interested into the details. Um, I want to focus directly on the results, and the result is that all the Barney from Alola and Raibar are genetically identical. So basically, the Barney is a true-to-type uh, cultivar. It has obviously implication in the sense that you can now um, make some DNA barcoding to identify uh, the palms that are actual uh, Barney. There is However, something that is quite interesting, I think, is the fact that this Barney from Alola is different from the Barney that is in Oman. So in Oman, Barney is also a very important variety. Actually, it's one of the top 10 uh, producing varieties um, in this country. Uh, but the Barney from uh, Oman is completely different, genetically speaking, from the Barney in uh, Alola. So anyway, that's all for uh, what I have to say for Barney, but now what we have uh, done for Barney and what I just showed you, we are in the process of doing for all the other uh, varieties in Alola. So basically we have sampled more than 500 uh, palms of the, well of the uh, 105 uh, varieties that we have identified um, in the region. We are in the process of, of doing the whole genome uh, sequencing, and so we will um, anytime soon uh, this year uh, make some analysis to check the genet genetic identity that is behind each of those names. And so, sorry, with that we will have a complete picture of Alula date palm diversity. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, the next phase of the project will be to reconstruct the origins of date palm cultivation in Alola. So we knew that the Nabataeans already uh, cultivated the date palm uh, more than 2,000 years ago, but we don't know when the cultivation has started, where the gene, uh, the gene pool originate originated from, and so that's what we want to study. And so what we will do is that we will use this modern genetic identity to reconstruct the past, that something is feasible, because basically our uh, history and the history of date palms is written in their uh, DNA, so you can study the DNA to reconstruct the past uh, diversity. And also what we will do is study uh, ancient samples, and this will basically uh, directly open a window to the past uh, diversity. So by um, studying ancient samples, I mean by archaeogenomics, uh, so basically getting some DNA from uh, ancient uh, remains, and also through uh, seed morphometrics, so making some calculation, uh, statistics, measurements on the seeds that are a very good indication of the varieties, the whether it's wild or cultivated, and, and so on. 
And so just a little example, um, here on the uh, top right, you can see those uh, fruits. Uh, they were basically part of a necklace um, that was found around the neck of a skeleton in uh, this Nabatean uh, tomb um, in uh, Hegra. And so basically we managed to get some DNA out of this sample. So it's 2,000 years old DNA, and I think it's pretty exciting, and I'm really looking forward uh, to see what the Nabatean, what dates the Nabateans uh, were growing 2,000 uh, years ago. Okay, so um, I'm almost done. Um, just wanted to say that uh, with this project, the Oasis of Alola will become the best studied um, oasis. Um, the richness of its date palms will be recognized, and this living oasis will become an extraordinary uh, destination for those that, like me, who are passionate about um, dates and uh, history. Time for acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Battesti, who could not uh, join today, but who is uh, leading the project uh, with me. Uh, my colleague from IRD, also uh, Rodwing, um, Professor Rodwing, who I'm working with uh, at, uh, at KAUST, and also Nahed Mohamed, and all the other collaborators. And of course, I would like to thank the Royal Commission of Alola for giving us the opportunity to, to study those, uh, this amazing race. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mura. Uh, very, very interesting uh, work. I just learned that uh, as a scientist, you have to be an archaeologist as well <laughs> to dig into the past. Uh, second speaker is Mr. Abdul Munim. Um, he's going to tell us some of the R&D or the research uh, work that is being uh, performed in the kingdom. Abdul Munim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sabah khair al jamia. بداية أود أشكر جامعة كاوس لتنظيم هذا المؤتمر وكذلك الشكر للدكتور بون لاختياري ضمن المتحدثين في هذه الجلسة سأتحدث باللغة العربية سأتحدث عن سوسة نخيل الحمراء خطورتها والتجارب الواعدة للسيطرة عليها في الحقيقة تهتم المملكة العربية السعودية بنخيل ومواطنيها بنخيل التمر فنخيل التمر له أهمية ليس فقط من ناحية زراعية أو اقتصادية ولكن أيضا من ناحية بيئية وغذائية ودينية وأيضا سياحية فنخيل التمر يعني لنا شيء الكثير بالنسبة لها طبعا ينتشر زراعة نخيل التمر في جميع أنحاء مناطق المملكة مثل ما ذكرت الأحصائيات هناك 33 مليون نخلة تمثل 27% من نخيل العالم ويوجد في المملكة 123 ألف مزرعة وتنتج المملكة من التمور حوالي مليون ونص طن تنتمي إلى أكثر من 400 صنف من التمور ويعتبر المواطن السعودي الأعلى استهلاكا للتمور بمعدل 35 كيلو في السنة كما تصدرت المملكة عام 2021 صادرات التمر على مستوى العالم حيث يقدر قيمة الصادرات بمليار وربع ريال وبشكل عام قطاع النخيل والتمور يقدر بحوالي 7.5 مليار سنويا وهو ما يمثل 12% من الانتاج الزراعي في المملكة في الحقيقة من غزة سوسة نخيل الحمراء وصارت نخيل أصبحت نخيل التمر مهددة تهديد حقيقي والسبب يرجع إلى أن سوسة نخيل الحمراء آفة مميتة بمعنى أي نخلة مصابة بالسوسة راح يكون مآلها الموت الحتمي إلا في حالة واحدة هو اكتشاف الإصابة في الوقت المناسب وهنا مكمن الصعوبة لأنه جميع أطوار الحشرة تكون متواجدة داخل النخلة ومخفية ويصعب على المزارعين اكتشافها في الوقت المناسب ومن سوء الحظ أصبحت سوسة نخيل الحمراء منتشرة في جميع مناطق زراعة النخيل في المملكة ما عدا منطقة الحدود الشمالية وأيضاً الطور الضار لهذه الحشرة هو الطور اليرقي حيث تتغذى بشراها داخل النخلة ويمكن للحشرة هذه أن تقضي على النخلة خلال فترة ثلاثة إلى ست شهور ويعتمد هذا على شدة الإصابة ولكن متى ما اكتشفت الإصابة بالرغم من الطور اليرقي هو الطور الضار لكن متى ما اكتشفت الإصابة في وقت مناسب فإنه يسهل علاج النخيل المصابة 
ومكمل خطوره في الحشرة الكاملة بالتحديد الإناث فهذه الحشرة تعيش من شهرين إلى ثلاث شهور ولا تخرج من النخلة إلا ملقحة فبالتالي تضع بيضها المخصب باستمرار دون الرجوع للتزاوج يعني تخرج من النخلة ملقحة وقادر على إنتاج البيض دون الرجوع إلى التزاوج وقد أولت وزارة الزراعة أو وزارة البيئة والمياه والزراعة اهتمام كبير مكافحة هذه الحشرة حقيقة وضعت استراتيجية عبر إنشاء برنامج متكامل وخطة تنفيذية لإدارة هذه الحشرة وأيضا وضع بروتوكول لإجراءات المكافحة يكون موحد في جميع المناطق وأهم عناصر الأي بي أم أو الإدارة المتكاملة للآفة هو الفحص الدوري الشامل وأيضا وسائل العلاج والحجر الزراعي والإرشاد والتوعية وقاعدة البيانات الجغرافية بالإضافة إلى التقييم والمتابعة لتطوير المكافحة طبعا يصعب أن أتكلم المجال ما ما أن أتكلم عن جميع النقاط لكن راح أتكلم عن أهم عنصرين هو الفحص الدوري الشامل بالإضافة إلى علاج الإصابة وبشكل مختصر المشكلة الرئيسية اللي نواجهها في مكافحة سوسة النخيل الحمراء هو وجود الإصابات البالغة هذا ينتج عنه انتشار الحشرات الكاملة فعساس نوقف هذا الشيء يحتاج أن نعمل فحص دوري كل 45 يوم وبالتحديد 45 هذا يعتبر مثالي وسبب اختيار 45 يوم يرجع إلى بولجية الحشرة أو دورة حياة الحشرة فهي من طور البيضة لحد نهاية طور العذراء تحتاج من 9 إلى 15 أسبوع فلو عملنا بالحد الأدنى اللي هو 9 أسابيع نلاحظ هناك أنه الثلاثة أسابيع الأولى لا يمكن اكتشاف الإصابة هنا لا يمكن اكتشاف الإصابة في ثلاثة أسابيع الأولى هذه أعراض الإصابة هي نشارة، عصارة، عجينة هذه ما تكون مرئية في ثلاثة أسابيع الأولى ويصب على المزارعين اكتشافها فبالتالي يبقى تبقى عندنا من الأسبوع الرابع إلى التاسع هي ما نقصد فيها ال 45 يوم فلو تم فحص النخيل كل 45 يوم فنحن نقدر نصل للإصابة قبل ما أن تنتج حشرات كاملة وهذه اعتمدتها الوزارة والآن تعمل عليها الحاجة الثانية هي علاج النخيل المصاب والوزارة تستخدم حاليا التبخير بأقراص مبيد فوسفيد الألمنيوم واستخدام فوسفيد الألمنيوم يعتبر شيء قديم يعني قبل 40 سنة كان يستخدم في عدة دول لكن الشيء الجديد هو في طريقة تطبيقه حيث ابتكر أحد مواطنين سعوديين واسمه البلاع طريقة أنه يعمل التبخير بطريقة يمنع تصرب الغاز ثم قامت وزارة البيئة والزراعة والمياه بتطوير العملية بإنشاء سترة خاصة لمعاملة النخيل المصاب حيث يستخدم خمس قراص لمدة خمس أيام تكون يعني كافية للقضاء على جميع أطوار الحشرة وعلاج النخيل المصابة سأستعرض الآن بعض الدراسات التي أجراها مركز النخيل والتمور فيما يتعلق بسوسة النخيل الحمراء طبعا الدراسات هي عديدة لكن اخترت أنا أربع دراسات حسب ما حسب المجال المتاح أول هذه الدراسات تعني بالحجر الزراعي حيث أن الحجر الزراعي يعتبر مهم جدا في وقف انتقال الحشرة ما بين المناطق وقد اهتمت الوزارة بتطبيق الحجر الزراعي وفي فترة من الفترات طبقتها تطبيق كامل أو حجر كامل حجر صارم يمنع فيه نقل الفسائل بشكل كامل وهذا أنتج عنه بعض السلبيات هي تراكم الفسائل تحت الأمهات وهذا الشيء يعيق الفحص احنا طالب الفحص لكن توجود الفسائل يعيق الفحص وأيضا كان مردود سلبي اقتصاديا على المزارعين أصبح لا يمكن بيع الفسائل بالإضافة إلى كثرة حالات تهريب الفسائل من قبل بعض الأشخاص ولتفادي هذه المشكلة قام المركز بعمل هذه التجربة وقد أشارت نتائجها أن معاملة الفسائل بالتغطيس أو الغمر لمدة نصف ساعة وبتركيز أربعة من ألف المية كفيلة في القضاء على سوسة نخيل الحمراء في حالة كانت متواجدة في الفسائل وأصبح الآن مسموح نقل الفسائل بشرط أن يأخذ ترخيص أنه عمل عملية التغطيس الدراسة الأخرى هي تقنية الجذب والقتل كفاءة تقنية الجذب والقتل 
وتم تجربة منتجين منتج أمريكي ومنتج كوستاريكي وهو عبارة عن عجينة يحتوي على الفرمون وهو جاذب لحشرة السوسة بالإضافة إلى المبيد مبيد حشري شديد السمية ويتم وضعه على النخلة كمية ثلاثة جرام هذه تستمر فعالة لمدة أكثر من ثلاثة شهور وقد أشارت النتائج إلى فعالية هذه العجينة في القضاء على الكثير من الحشرات خصوصا في المناطق العالية الإصابة وطبقت هذه العملية في مرة ثانية وأشارت تقارير إلى فعالية هذه الطريقة في وساهمت في القضاء على سوس الخيل الحمراء في مرة ثانية أيضا الدراسة الثالثة تقييم كفاءة جهاز أجرنت للكشف المبكر لإصابة سوس النخيل الحمراء وهذا تعتمد على تقنية رصد الصوت وهو عبارة عن سنسور يتم غرس مسمار داخل النخلة وفي نهاية السنسور بحيث يرصد الأصوات الموجودة داخل النخلة ويرسلها للشركة الأم عن طريق الإنترنت فتقوم الشركة بتحليل هذه الأصوات ترددات وتمييزها إن كانت سوسة أو لا فترسل التقارير في الحقيقة كان كفاءة هذه الطريقة محدودة لأنه خصوصا مع تعامل الإصابات السليمة أنه تعطي مؤشرات أنها مصابة هو في الحقيقة غير مصابة فيحتاج إلى مزيد من التطوير الدراسة الرابعة والأخيرة هي إدارة سوسة النخيل الحمراء بمنهجية جديدة وهذه الدراسة طبقت في واحة الأحساء بمنطقة المراح والعيون منطقة تحتوي على 600 مزرعة وحجم 65 ألف نخلة هدفت التجربة إلى إلى فحص اكتشاف النخيل المصاب قبل توصل مراحل الحشرة إلى مراحل أطوال الحشرة إلى الحشرات الكاملة اللي أشرت لها وهذا عن طريق يتم الفحص الدوري الشامل كل 45 يوم ومعيار النجاح أو المقياس هو نسبة تواجد الإصابات الشديدة بمعنى أنه متى إذا كانت الإصابات الشديدة كثيرة فهذا معناه أنه يؤثر على نتاج هذه الدراسة الخطة طبعا المنطقة كان يطبق فيها برنامج مختلف كان يستخدم فيها المصائد الفرمونية بكثرة ويستخدم فيها رش المبيدات بكثرة وأيضا الفحص لكن نحن لما هذه الدراسة اعتمدت على الفحص الدوري الشامل بنسبة 98% المبيدات صفر ما في تطبيق مبيدات مصاد الفرمونية استخدمناها للتقييم فبالتالي قللنا استخدام المصاد بأكثر من 90% نحن استخدمنا المصاد فقط أسبوع كل ثلاث شهور فقط بغرض التقييم وليس الصيد الحشرات وقد أشارت النتائج في وجود إصابات كثيرة في بداية استلام المنطقة ولكن سرعان ما انخفضت الإصابة نتيجة الفحص الدور الشامل وقد تمكننا من خفض الإصابة بنسبة 98% وما يعزز هذه النتائج هي قراءات المصايد اللي تم نشرها ها في البداية لاحظ أنه الاصطياد 103 حشرة لكن في نهاية التجربة حشرتين وهذا علاقة يعني نتيجة صحيحة لأن المصائد لها علاقة طردية كل ما زادت الإصابات كل ما زاد عدد الحشرات كل ما انخفض عدد الإصابات انخفض عدد الحشرات في الحقيقة واجهتنا بعض الصعوبات أو المعوقات في الحصول على في الحصول على يعني الآن النتائج حصلناها 98% بعد 24 شهر قد تأخر الحصول على هذا النتائج بسبب وجود بعض المعوقات وأهمها هي المزارع المغلقة في كل دورة فحص نجد أن تقريبا 5 إلى 10% مزارع مغلقة لم يتم فحصها بالإضافة إلى بعض النخيل المهمل والذي لا يمكن الفاحص أن يلاحظ الأعراض بالإضافة إلى إصابات القمية الخلاصة أن هذه المنهجية يمكن التعايش معها وهي تعتبر مكافحة مستدامة لأنها آمنة وأقل تكلفة وأيضا لها فعالية كذلك نحن الآن بحاجة أكثر من أي وقت مضى إلى استخدام التقنيات الحديثة وأيضا الذكاء الاصطناعي للمساعدة في زيادة فعالية السيطرة على سوس النخيل الحمراء للاكتشاف المبكر والسيطرة على الآفة خصوصا التعامل مع المزارع المغلقة وأيضا النخيل الغير مهيئ للفحص بالإضافة إلى الإصابات القمية 
وشكرا لكم Thank you, Abdulim. There's a lot of work that has been done, and uh, hope that we'll be able to sort out a very effective method very soon for the kingdom. Um, the first speaker is Dr. Richard uh, Mankin. He's going to talk about uh, some machine learning methods um, and to uh, address the red palm visas. Thank you for that uh, very uh, informative talk. Uh, I, I appreciate being brought up to date with uh, what is happening in uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, so my talk is on machine learning tools for discrimination of sounds produced by different insect species in individual trees. Uh, th that's uh, uh, based on the uh, the the theme of the the presentations, uh, but first I'd like to mention a, a little bit about what's uh, happening in the United States with respect to red palm weevil. And uh, fortunately, the answer is not not a lot of uh, problems in the Americas to this point. But uh, for uh, about 20 years, I have been. Uh, interested in the red, red palm weevil as an insect that that is easily detected by acoustic methods that that I have worked with for a lot of years, and and I could see uh, from uh, back in the mid 2000s that this was uh, potentially a problem in Florida where I live. And I didn't really want to see all, all the palm trees, in, including several in my uh, yard in Gainesville, uh, dying of uh, red palm weevil. So I, I became interested in the technology and what to do to help keep this from coming to pass. Right now, there's only two places, Aruba and Curaçao, which are islands uh, near Venezuela uh, off the northern part of uh, South America. This, these uh, were imported uh, possibly from Egypt or somewhere to uh, have uh, palm trees on the, uh, in, in the, the resort areas. Uh, and fortunately, that those are not uh, uh, areas of, of uh, high uh, agricultural uh, extent. Okay, so to set the stage, I thought I would present uh, uh, a slide that, that shows uh, the types of signals you detect with uh, acoustics. Uh, the, uh, in this case, uh, an easy one to see is the, the male call and the female reply of the Asian citrus psyllid, which makes vibrations on the plants. Uh, these are uh, or orange trees primarily, and uh, the uh, the top slide shows the relative amplitude of the signal uh, of the male call and the female reply. The bottom shows a spectrogram, which is a plot of the frequency on the vertical axis, uh, and you you have time on the horizontal axis. Uh, as you can see, the frequencies the it, these are wing beats of the insect, and they are uh, the the wings have har harmonics uh, be because the it, it, it's sort of like uh, when you pluck a string that you have harmonics that that uh, are detected, and these are easy to to detect and process using the standards standard acoustic methods. And, and it's easy to uh, work with them and distinguish them from other insects. Now, in this particular case, the males and the females are so similar that, that they're hard to detect differences in. And I have been working for maybe five or six years to do this by the standard methods, and it wasn't, 
working. So I got interested in machine, learn great mach machine learning to do this. And uh, uh, OK, I apologize for the slide here. It's a little complicated, but uh, but the the uh, application I was thinking of for uh, uh, for Saudi Arabian uh, uh, palm orchards is that there are there are the red palm weevils and also other insects that that you have in the orchards and uh, one that I ran across on a, a trip to Saudi Arabia in uh, 2014 was Arictus elegans. And I was able, by uh, looking at standard methods of, of working with uh, the signals to distinguish between the timing of the red palm weevil activities and the timing of the Erectus elegans activities. Uh, it's not as important as a pest, but it's still uh, uh, of, of interest to uh, persons in the, in the orchards the uh, the in the new study I have started working uh, it's not finished yet I have started working with uh, sounds that I had collected from known red palm weevils and known uh, erectus elegans uh, and I'm I'm planning to use a one-dimensional convolutional neural network. I hope that doesn't scare anybody. Uh, and uh, use that to predict the, uh, the red palm weevil differences from the Erectus elegans. And uh, I have some uh, references uh, for uh, anyone who's interested. And I would like anyone who is interested in this type of work that wants to talk, I, I would be happy also to uh, find out what is happening at, at CAUST well, with respect to machine learning. And uh, I am also interested in talking, talk, talking to Dr. Oi about the, the methods that he uses wi with the optical fibers, uh, because I think this, uh, this is also something that that uh, would complement the work with acoustic detection. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I look forward to working more with uh, the people in Saudi Arabia to uh, help, help reduce the problem of this very important insect. OK, thank you. <laughs> you OK? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Ar uh, Isra Masri, is going to talk about some of the development uh, that he did uh, in the Kingdom and Cows. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you all for your attendance. So the title of my talk today is the Early Detection of Red Palm Weevil Using Fiber Optic Distributed Acoustic Sensors. So I will start with presenting the current techniques that can be used for the detection of red palm weevil. So the first method is based on touching. And this means the farmers can conduct like manual inspection to find the red palm weevil within the tree. And there are like basically four different categories or four different techniques. Uh, the second one is by seeing by visualization. So either by visual inspection or by uh, applying CT scan and thermal imaging. Uh, the third method is by listening. So people can listen to the acoustic noise, the sound that the larva can produce while they are eating uh, the tree trunk. And this can be applied by microphones or acoustic sensors. Uh, eventually, the last one is smelling. And uh, in these techniques, uh, animals like trained dogs can smell the presence of red palm weevil and they can discriminate the healthy and infested trees. 
Uh, and indeed, these techniques are very reliable, very accurate. Uh, but all of them share a certain challenge, which is uh, scalability. Scalability because here in all of these techniques, you have to scan the trees one by one, individually. So you cannot scan all the entire farm at once. And this, of course, a time-consuming process. But the good thing is all of these pests like make noise while they are destroying the crops. So let's take the red palm weevil as an example here. So when there is an infested tree, so the first signal that you can get from an infested tree is the acoustic noise that can be produced by the larva while they are consuming the tree trunk. So as uh, Dr. McKean just mentioned, so it looks at the acoustic methods, the listening, is the most promising one for the early detection of red palm weevil. Because Mr. Abdel Menem just mentioned, it is important to early detect the red palm weevil before it becomes a beetle and it can spread between the trees and lay the eggs. Okay, so I will talk about the technology that we develop here in KAUST. So we use uh, optical fibers, uh, and optical fibers, if, if you attend the last panel for Professor uh, Salim and Dr. Professor Shebeli, so they highlighted the importance of optical fibers for telecommunications. You know, the main purpose of optical fiber is to transmit data, video and text between countries and so. But there is another important application for optical fibers, which is sensing. So it means the entire optical fiber can act as acoustic sensor, like microphones, all of the fibers. You can imagine it as discrete acoustic, uh, discrete microphones. So we have the optical fiber and we keep winding the optical fibers around the individual trees. And the input of the fiber is connected to a sensing unit. We call it interrogator. And this interrogator like sends the light along the optical fiber and it can scan the entire farm at once. So the sensing unit extracts the acoustic signal along the entire fiber. So no need to scan them one by one. So now you are doing the scanning in parallel. So this like save a lot of time. So our technique is precise. I will show you some of our results in the subsequent uh, slides. And fast, because you know, no need for individual scanning. And also non-destructive because we don't need to uh, like uh, drill holes to listen to the acoustic sound, just on the surface. And the sensing unit can work 24 seven if needed and also affordable. <coughs> so this video can show you how we deploy the fiber optic sensing technology in the, fi in the field. So maybe uh, I cannot run it here, but Okay, so we have the fiber, and as I mentioned, we keep winding it around the individual trees, and eventually, just one optical fiber, it is connected to the interrogator or the sensing unit to scan the entire farm uh, simultaneously. Okay, so as I mentioned, we rely on fiber optics, but we also support our technology with uh, machine learning. And why we need machine learning? Uh, machine learning uh, because within the tree, there might be a red palm weevil. These produce acoustic noise. This is what we want to detect. But this is not the only source of acoustic uh, noise in the trees. There are many others. So we may find birds around the fiber and around the trees, uh, watering, wind, digging, and many others. And you, you are in need here for a very powerful classification method. So it can classify these different sounds and to distinguish the healthy and the infested trees. So we pass all of the data to a machine learning, trained machine learning model that we train in the time and the frequency domain. And this model can declare which tree is healthy and which one is infested. So this figure like summarize our overall approach. So we wind the fiber around the trees and the sensing unit like extract the sound from the optical fibers 
and the entire farm, pass it to a neural network, machine learning model, and the machine learning can classify which one is healthy and which three is infested. Okay, so we also apply our methods in different environments. So we start with the lab environment here at Kaos. And in the lab environment, we mimic the real situation in farms. So we use like loudspeaker to generate the sound of red palm weave that we record before. And also we apply the technique in controlled environment, real larva with age like less than two weeks, but the trees are placed in closed room, controlled environment and also in farms. And let me show you some of our uh, results. <coughs> so the top ones are in controlled environment. Uh, the trees are in closed room. So we have two different experiments here. So in experiment one, we have four trees. Uh, two of them are infested and the second two are healthy. And the Y axis like uh, describes uh, the number of infestation alarms that the machine learning model produce for the individual trees. And we can see there is like obvious contrast between the number of infestation alarms for the infested and the healthy trees. Also for the second experiment, for other different trees, there is like also clear uh, difference between the number of infestation alarms of the infested and healthy trees. And also we move to outdoor farm, like farms in outdoor environment. And we run the experiments in with 19 trees. Two of them are infested, and the remaining are all 17 are all healthy ones. Uh, in this figure in the middle, so the wind was very calm, like uh, the harsh environment, you know, there is almost a very weak wind. And we can see there is like obvious also contrast in the infestation alarms between the infested and the healthy trees. Also, we run the experiment when the wind starts to increase and we can see our sensors start to catch some false alarms because of these winds. But still, there is obvious contrast between the two infested ones and the remaining health trees. I just uh, zoom in the false alarms here in this experiment. In the kingdom, we run many field trials and uh, mainly with the help of uh, MEWA team or El Hassa Center uh, of Palms and Dates in the Eastern Province of KSA. So we have very strong uh, collaboration. Uh, in Kaust, we have uh, Professor Boon Ui and Chun Hong uh, and Diwan Mao. And also we collaborated with the MEWA team, Dr. Youssef and Mr. Abdel Menem, <coughs> Mr. Mansour uh, and many others. Uh, and here I'd like to highlight the importance of the collaboration because for us we are like electrical engineers so we do not have this expert uh, about the red palm weave so we have learned a lot from the team uh, in MEWA and they have helped us a lot for the artificial infestation it's uh, very difficult to find infestation in the field if there is a farmer and he finds infested tree they will directly kill them or remove the tree but the team in El, uh, in, uh, in El Hassa helped us to, to do the artificial infestation. Uh, our work has been uh, recently recognized by uh, some awards. So just this month, we won the Khalifa Award in 2023. <coughs> and also in December 2022, we won another prize from the National Center for Palms and Dates and our technology has been featured in National Geographic, Arab News, and many others. Uh, our target is not only the detection of red palm weave. This is the initial target that we are focusing on. But eventually, we want to go to smart farming. Uh, and I think this is the goal for uh, many entities. Uh, optical sensors are important because it can be used for health, to monitor the health of crops, to get the soil of the, uh, the moisture of the soil. And also it can be used for farm integrity. So for example, we can use optical fiber as temperature sensor, not only acoustic sensors, and its accuracy is very high, 0.1 degrees Celsius. 
So suppose you have the optical fiber around the trees for the red palm weevil detection, but also you can detect the temperature. So in case if there is fire, for example, at any location, the optical fiber can quickly and precisely locate uh, the source of fire. Also for hazard detection, if there is flooding or even if there is intrusion to the farm, optical fibers can be used for these purposes. Many, many important applications and not only limited to the agriculture. Of course, pest detection we mentioned and for pipeline monitoring, if you have pipeline and you use it for watering or even for the oil and gas industry, if there are oil also, if there is leak, the optical fiber can detect the location of the leakage and many others. So this is our all uh, overall like uh, smart farming goal. So a summary. So we started with using fiber optic acoustic sensors for the detection of red palm weevil. And now we are working to add the temperature sensor because in the literature we find infested trees with red palm weevil, the trunk temperature has higher temperature compared to the other healthy ones. And since our optical fiber can measure the temperature, so this can be another parameter to declare if the tree is infested or healthy. And we'll use fiber optics for multi-parameter sensing and also the commercialization. So thank you all for your attendance. Thank you, Islam. Thank you, Islam. Right, if I dare not to claim any credits, I only come up with the idea and then key all those hard work are done by Islam, Chun Hong, and the team. And of course, I have to thank uh, um, Mr. Uh, Mewar team, uh, Ab Dumanium, uh, for all this collaboration. I really hope that um, being able to establish very close collaborations with Professor Kram and uh, Professor Rockwing, as well as uh, experts uh, in um, the biodiversity and etc. with Dr. Morel and uh, we have been talking quite a bit with uh, Dr. Uh, Menkin about the future collaborations. I'd like to invite all the uh, speaker to come on stage so they can then uh, take some questions from the audience. All right, um, now it's uh, open to question, if you have any. Please, um, Professor Saleh. Presentations and the new information that we gain today. Uh, my question is for Mr. Abdelman and Mr. Lawi. I mean, why should I wait until we get infected by the insect itself? Is there any vaccination or هل في أي تطعيم لل للنخلة بحيث أنها تكون وقاية لها بدل ما أنتظر حتى تصاب؟ نعم نعم طبعاً هذا ما بيدك النخلة ممكن تصاب النخلة ممكن تصاب وأنت ما تعلم فقصدك نحن نرش رش مبيدات على صحيح حماية إيه نعم طبعاً إحنا إحنا عند سبب اختيارنا لل المنهجية اللي أنا عرضتها كثرة استخدام بيدات وهذا غير صحي له أضرار كبيرة على البيئة وعلى الأحياء وعلى المتبقيات وهذا فبالتالي هذا محل لأن الرش الوقائي بالمبيدات يعطيك حماية فقط هو شو القصد سوس نخيل حمراء طفيل جروح أي جرح طري راح تقدر تصيبه يعني ما تقدر تصيب النخلة إلا وجود الجروح الطرية فبالتالي ما له داعي ترش إلا إذا أنت عملت الجرح فاحنا نرشد المزارعين إذا أنت عملت جرح سلك فسيلة أو راكوب أو أي عملية ينتج عنها جرح يحتاج يعامل غير كذا ما يحتاج المعاملة لأن, لأن هذا المبيد ما راح يعطيك وقاية إلا أيام محدودة فبالتالي هل, هل أنا مطالب أني أرش كل أسبوع؟ احنا رشة في السنة ومستوعبينها فما ما نقدر نستمر في رش المبيدات على النخيل فأفضل شيء لقاية النخيل هو أنك يعني في عمليات لكن أهمها أنك تبعد مياه الري عن الساق بالإضافة أنك تعامل أي جرح في نفس الوقت 
مع الفحص بشكل مستمر بليز السلام عليكم اشكركم على هذه المحاضرات عندي سؤال للدكتور اسلام متى نقدر نطبقها هذه بشكل يعني على نطاق واسع وممكن مليون مليونين نخلة السؤال الثاني أنت كتبت أن أسعارها معقولة تتراوح كم للنخلة تقريبا آخر سؤال أنت يعني في الصور اللي شفناها أنه لازم تكون الشبكة متواصلة مع بعض للنخيل هل هذا لازم ولا فقط في الرسمة اللي موجودة اللغة العربية هو سؤال مهم ثلاث أسئلة مهمين جدا سو تعال نبدأ الأول في طول الأوبتيكال فايبر هو تقريبا طوله بيكون في حدود 10 كيلو متر وده تقريبا ممكن يغطي 1000 شجرة 1000 شجرة طيب احنا لو اتكلمنا على التكلفة تقريبا سعر ال 1 كيلو متر الأوبتيكال فايبر سعره لو استخدمنا فيري جود جاكيت تقريبا 300 دولار و 1 كيلو متر ممكن يغطي تقريبا 100 شجره يبقى التكلفه في حدود 3 دولار لكل شجره يبقى محتاجين الاوبتيكال فايبر تقريبا 3 دولار لكل شجره ده بالنسبه للتكلفه للفايبر فهو سعره رخيص جدا احنا زي ما بنقول هو بنستخدمه في الكوميونيكيشن ولكن التكلفه بتكون اكتر في السنسنج يونت اللي هي البوكس اللي انا وضحتها بيكون سعره غالي الميزه زي ما مهندس عبد المنعم قال إن الدورة تقريبا في حدود 45 يوم فما ما فيش داعي ان احنا نعمل كونتينوس مونيتورنج يعني 24 7 ما فيش داعي ممكن مرة كل شهر آه فالسنسنج يونت ممكن نستخدمها مع اكتر من مزرعة فنسيب الفايبر اللي هو سعره رخيص 3 دولار لكل آه تقريبا شجرة ونستخدم السنسنج يونت از ا شيرد يونت بتوين الفارمرز ده بالنسبة للسعر وبالنسبة لل لل عدد الاشجار آه تقريبا ممكن يوصل لحد 10 كيلو متر يغطي 1000 شجره وهكذا دي ممكن تعاد مع عدد اشجار مختلف لكن احيانا يكون في تشتيت في النخيل يعني شويه هنا وشويه هنا ما ما تكون كلها في نطاق واحد كويس احنا ممكن نحط الاوبتيكال فايبر في المزرعه الاولى والمزرعه الثانيه والمزرعه الثالثه لان زي ما قلت لك هو سعر رخيص والسكانينج اللي هو السنسنج يونت لما يتواصل بالاوبتيكال فايبر بياخد تقريبا ثلاث ساعات فممكن نقضي ثلاث ساعات هنا وثلاث ساعات في المزرعه الاخرى والثالثه وغيره ونعيد الموضوع ده كل تقريبا شهر عشان نغطي السايكل اللي هي في حدود 45 يوم. احنا يعني جاهزين للتطبيق يعني عايزين ان احنا نبدا نطبقه على انتاج اوسع ان هو لو نقدر نطبقه في العلا او او في غيره في الحسا على نطاق اوسع فاحنا جاهزين للمرحله دي دي المرحله الجايه شكرا ام سوري تراي تو سورت ذس اوت اه يس بليز اف يو اف يو وونت انا هبه كردي بروفيسور في الذكاء الاصطناعي من جامعه الملك سعود احنا عندنا برضو ابحاث في مجال سوسه النخيل بتعاون مع كليه الزراعه Uh, I think uh, what we are doing is also interesting لأنه uh, بيعمل uh, محاولة لمقاومة uh, هذه السوسة بطريقة مختلفة اللي هي من ناحية البريدكشن فإحنا بندرس الفيتشرز حقة النخيل المصابة وغير المصابة and we have already يعني come with good results in order to predict قبل ما النخلة تصاب أصلا إنه هذه النخلة most likely إنها تكون مصابة أو هذه النخلة عادة اللي ليها هذه الفيتشرز ما تكون مصابة. So I think this uh, يعني can be integrated with, with what you are doing also. So we have uh, يعني uh, a holistic approach to uh, يعني نقاوم السوسة بهذه الطريقة. أعتقد إنه موضوع ال prediction أقل تكلفة بكثير. شكرا. I don't quite get the question. I'm so sorry about this thing. It's, 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 um, uh, maybe Islam, can you? I think what you're talking about is very important. If we can predict the disease, it will be better and better. It will offer a lot of benefits. If Professor Boone said that the benefits can be 8 million dollars every year. 
مجرد عشان نشيل النخيل المصاب فلو نقدر نتوقع اكيد نتواصل مع حضرتك يكون فكره كويسه للتعاون اكيد الديتا سيت بناء على مزارع يعني موجوده اوريدي وبيننا وبين اصحابها تعاون في هذا المجال سو ات از فيري انتريستنج انه وي كود يعني ميك بريدكشن على عدد يعتبر معقول جدا من النخلات المصابه وغير المصابه ممتاز شكرا ثانك يو ثانك يو فور كويشن يا بليز Can you hold on? So just my microphone so that everybody can hear it. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Abdurrahman Al-Adiyya, a dean of engineering college at Qasim University and a professor in mechanical engineering. Uh, first of all, thanks for speaking, nice speaking, and I'm really happy if uh, different disciplines can have, uh, help each other, like in engineering, help in agriculture. Uh, I have just a question, maybe in saying Arabic for uh, okay. uh, You said we, I mean, there's no in the middle of 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 the حتى الحدود الشمالية لكن لم تسجل فيها إصابة حد الآن بسبب أنه ما ما في حد نقل فسائل مصابة فبالتالي الحمد لله ما انتقلت الحمد لله لا 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 ما له علاقة بالطقس السوسة هذه قوية تصيب يعني ما فيها فترة سكون طوال السنة نعم فترة الشتاء يكون فيها قلة في نشاط الحشرة لكن إجمالا الإصابات مستمرة طوال السنة Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, um, uh, yeah, hi um, Rod Wing from uh, Kaust. Uh, you mentioned uh, $3 um, to wire a tree. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. $3. So we have $35 million uh, day palms, so that's $100 million. Uh, I think that should be a good investment. I mean, I, I mean, if you if you actually wired all the day palms and you could possibly eradicate um, the red palm weevil in this country within a couple of years, mm -hmm. right? I mean, is that the goal? I think that that is a very, very good um, uh, question. Maybe I'll ask um, Dr. Mankin to mention about um, by using acoustic or your te technology that you're working on right now, um, what, what could be the cost uh, about the material cost as well as system cost then uh, maintenance cost as well? Do you have these predictions or rough number? Um, it, it, okay, so to me, the, the big problem with uh, acoustic methods uh, that I see is, is different if you can instrument every tree with the optical fiber is that uh, there you, the, the person power to do the, uh, <coughs> the inspections of every tree is, is just not there. It, it is too too costly in, in human effort to, to do that. So my goal in doing this kind of research was to just help develop uh, methods that, that could understand better the, the, the best ways to attack the, the red palm weevil I issue in, in where it's uh, uh, killing the trees, and uh, and also to to use this for uh, detection of other insects as well. So so it is a more of a general purpose uh, approach, not not just the uh, red palm weevil. Uh, I I do think that ultimately um, the te technologies that that view hmm. from above or, or perhaps uh, optical fiber on every tree will, will work out better for, for orchards uh, than, than simply uh, going from tree to tree uh, look, looking at it to see 
if it has an infestation. Uh, the acoustic methods do do work pretty well for that, but but there are just too many, too many, way too many trees. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Just as my personal opinion, um, we know the cost for other uh, sensor is using uh, using the IoT uh, acoustic method. That is about twenty seven uh, US dollars per tree. Uh, they are doing it in in um, UAE, Abu Dhabi, and um, that that is the the current technology that people are willing to pay. But that means uh, if being able to deploy those sensor, personal opinions, uh, I think um, because the manpower cost become very minimum, then in terms of the system cost, as of today, is still fairly expensive. But we can provide as a service, for example. In that case, we do not necessarily need to send or deploy people to the field to uh, pick house signals. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just, you know, I mean, if I had a couple hundred million dollars, I'd invest that immediately to eradicate mm. the red palm weevil in this country. You could, you could actually do that, and it could be a, a real success story over the next couple of years. I, I don't know. I think the MIWA ought to really consider doing something like that. Um, I, I, had, I had a question for Muriel. Just, um, I'm, um, Muriel, how, how, what is... Uh, I might have missed the number, but what are the, um, what is your estimate of the number of unique uh, varieties in Aula, and or, or is that still out there right now? Well, yeah, frankly, I won't be able to answer that question now. Um, I mean, there is over a hundred names, but we know that they are not just unique genotype, all of them. Um, now, we have sample more than 500 uh, palms, um, we'll see about the estimate uh, we can get out of it. I think we should get close um, to some saturation curve to estimate properly the diversity with this number. Um, we should not forget that there are plenty of seedlings everywhere um, growing in the gardens that represent a lot of diversity and unique combinations of genes. So basically, I mean, it's kind you have an infinite number of combinations. The diversity, you have it, and it's a finite number, but then in the combination, it's an infinite uh, number. So, well, that's gonna be my answer. I think it's pretty hard to, like, give an actual number on, on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. TK. A few of his workshop is uh, smart uh, farming. So the use of uh, fiber sensing is definitely goes beyond uh, red palm weevil detection. So I think the technology is really good for. Uh, like uh, detecting water leakage, uh, farm securities, uh, to protect the, the, the valuable uh, assets of the farmers. So I have related questions to, uh, you know, how do we integrate uh, different sensing technologies? Because we have uh, acoustics, we have uh, fibers, uh, maybe even there are many others. How do we integrate these uh, various sensing technologies? Or maybe the deployment uh, strategy, right? Uh, for detecting water leak and other things to give us a more, even more intelligent or smart farming. Can we integrate different technologies together? Uh, this is the first question. And can these sensing technologies be made adaptive to address the infestation of different, uh, perhaps different weevil species, or to identify different types of farms? Let's say if uh, we want to know in certain areas, not specific to farm, if there are different types of uh, palm trees, Maybe mm, I right. address this to the panel. Sure, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Maybe I'd like to um, get uh, Dr. Mankin's view on what, what's your vision towards the so-called smart farming? Uh, yes, uh, with, with respect to uh, different s insect species, I, I think there is a very good uh, uh, potential for using machine learning to to distinguish among different different pest species, and, and there are there are multiple species. Although the red palm weevil is is by far the most important in in the, the date palm trees, and uh, I am uh, very interested also in the optical uh, fiber mechanisms for for detecting water leaks and. Uh, uh, temperature changes uh, in particular. Uh, you, you cannot do this uh, with, uh, with acoustics unless you are listening at night to crickets because they, 
the, the uh, warmer the temperature, the, the higher their rate of calling. Uh, but, but otherwise, uh, there is uh, you, the acoustic methods do not uh, cover cover those things. And uh, s smart farming, I believe, is going to be more important as time goes by because the amount of land to have to grow your food is is going to decrease uh, partly to increases in people and partly to changes in climate that uh, will make some areas not so uh, able to grow food as, as before. And uh, th these are things that uh, engineers and uh, persons in agriculture are, are very interested in and are trying very, very hard to, to, to move forward on, on these issues, like, like you said. Thank you. I would like to get Muriel's uh, view on whether the so-called, this broadly defined smart farming uh, and technology would be able to help you to do your job um, to, for example, analyze the gene and um, to um, keep the diversity of the uh, date palms. Um, well, that's, that's pretty hard to answer, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty far from the smart farming and from the, from the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we are rather working like directly in the field, um, but then it's true that we work also in the labs with, uh, with the genomic data. Um, when we are in the field with my colleague, doc Dr. Battisti, we always imagine that at some point we won't have to sample the palms with the leaves and do the extraction and so on, and that maybe you will be able to scan the genomes, you know, <laughs> just super easily. And that's no too need difficult to for us to do. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's where we should go. <laughs> that would facilitate my job, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Islam? Yeah, maybe uh, let me address your second question regarding the integration of different kinds of sensors for smart farming and also for the detection of red palm wheat. You know, there is um, a very strong connection between farmers and palm trees because, uh, you know, he can find the farmer, can find the palm tree when he was a child uh, until, uh, until uh, like 40, 50 years uh, later. So, Removing a tree uh, by declaring it is infested and because of a false alarm, this will be a disaster uh, for farmers, right? So having multiple techniques to double check if the tree is infested or not is very important. So, and this indeed can be done. So if, for example, we can use optical fibers, okay, for the detection of red palm weed, and if there is like point sensors, uh, acoustic sensors running in parallel and both of them declare this tree is infested so we increase the probability and reliability of our sensors and also this can be followed by the visual inspection so we are sure that if we will heal or remove this tree so our decision is correct and avoid harming uh, the farmers. Thank you. Abdelbunyam, can I get your views as well on this uh, question? Yes. Of course, the knowledge of the industry and the techniques of the industry has become related to all the fields of life, especially in the area of technology. And in terms of the question that I remember, why only in the area of the industry? It's not just in the area of the industry, but in the area of the industry, this is what we call the economic development. فتهم المزارعين ولها خسائر كبيرة فبالتالي نحاول نحن نركز عليها ولكن أي شيء قطر أو مهم جدا يطلب ندخل مجالات التقنية الحديثة والذكاء الصناعي إما لتطويره أو لتقليل التكاليف سواء كان مجال حشرات أو مجال مياه أو مجال أي مجال في الزراعة نحن بحاجة إدخالها وفعلا الآن مركز النخيل والتمور في الأحساء يحاول إدخال جميع هذه التقنيات في عمليات خدمة النخلة سواء من عملية اللقاح من عملية الأسمدة قياس الأملاح والاحتياجات الغذائية بالإضافة إلى الصبات الحشرية Thank you Maybe we can uh, take uh, another question Hey, uh, Dr. Malkin, I uh, was wondering if you could speak more to the uh, red palm weevil potential infestation in the U.S. Is that, um, has that not been happening um, because of like natural and um, artificial protections or is it more just of a matter of time and perhaps luck that 
um, we haven't seen infestation? Um, I, I attribute it uh, a fair amount of it to luck, and uh, I, I think that there, uh, Florida, where, where I'm from, does have many infestations of, of insects that come in, uh, but uh, it is well known in the United States that red palm weevil is, is a really bad actor uh, because it, is, uh, it spreads so quickly. Now, we do uh, pay very close attention to early identification of infestations. And uh, fortunately, in the United States, it's only a few of the southern locations, including Florida and California, that, that have the most likelihood of, of uh, an in infestation actually working. But uh, we, we did expect uh, infestations to happen in, in the United States uh, before now, and, and we pay very close attention to Curacao and Aruba uh, and, and avoid bringing any palm trees in, into the United States. Uh, I think at some point it, it will come in, and uh, one thing uh, I am very interested in, uh, it's not my field of work, but I have discussed with uh, numerous people at the entomology meetings, uh, if we can come up with uh, ways to pinpoint what it is about the behavior of, of these species that are so invasive, what makes them so invasive, it, it will help us uh, o overcome their introductions in, in the future, I think. Thanks, Rich. Please. Yes, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for this achievement, which is a viable achievement. And this is a mandatory achievement for any innovation will be sustainable. Uh, and the cost of this uh, achievement is very low. And I wish that it will be a national initiative to wire all the palm trees in the country to detect the red uh, weevil. And also for other things, we can use it for other insects, for other uh, behavior of the palm trees. And these sensors are used for the uh, artificial intelligence, for the machine learning, so we can collect this huge data set for any application later on. So I really want to congratulate you, and I wish you for... Oh, thank you. Thank this thank thanks for success. the comment. Yeah, thank you. Professor Salah? Can you give us microphone? Yeah. I would like to ask about the training data. Oh. Is it from the field or it is a synthetic one? Oh, this is from the field. From so the field? Yeah, from the field because we collaborate with the MEWA team. So they make artificial uh, infestation for real larva of the ages that we want to detect, like two or three weeks. So we go to the field and collect the data by our optical fibers with the real sound of larva. And also from the real environment. So we collect the sound from the sea, if there are cars, uh, uh, wind, whatever. So we collect all of these data from the field. And we pass them all to a machine learning model in the time and frequency domain to train the model. But why did you mention that the processing would take around three hours? No, because you, you keep like uh, collecting the data and pass them to machine learning. Okay, and the machine learning will count the number of alarms. Sometimes the red palm weevil are not producing sound, you know. So because we collect the data, for example, for one second and pass it to machine learning, and another second and pass it to the machine learning, maybe the red palm weevil is not active in this second. So you need two, three hours to build the number of infestation alarms to reliably declare this tree is infested or healthy. So but how do you know the location of the, uh, because you are uh, just using a single uh, uh, fiber, right? Yes. How do you know the, the location of the palm infected? Yes. So I, I will go to the technical side, you know, so we send pulse in the optical fiber and uh, from the time of light, you know, we know the refractive index of the optical fiber, so we can exactly know the location of the palm tree along with the optical fiber. 
so you can assume the optical fiber is like multiple uh, point sensors. Thank you very much. Richard, do you have any point to add? Uh, yes, I, I would like to say that um, it, is, it is true that the red palm weevils are not always uh, moving and feeding so that you do not always hear them, but uh, certainly uh, starting in the morning and, and going through the early afternoon, if w what I have seen uh, from natural infestations is that you usually have uh, eight, eight to 20 insects in the, in the trees and, and some of these are gonna be active. And if you are listening, you can detect <laughs> within 15 seconds <laughs> that that <laughs> these are the the right species of insects. Uh, if you if you uh, train yourself to to listen for for particular patterns, uh, so so the timing is not so much of a problem. Uh, I I do think that the optical fiber systems probably will, me methods will be developed to, to collect that information more quickly, to identify some of it more quickly. And the benefit that I see from the optical fiber is that it picks up lot, a lot more than just the vibrational information, but temperature and, and other things. And, and so it is a, a general purpose uh, uh, mechanism for precision farming. I believe. Thank you, Richard. Please. Mohammed Al Sheikh from King Saud University. I have a question for uh, Dr. Islam. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background about the optical system, the type of uh, optical source, the pulse width, and what currently limits the length of interferometers? Uh, okay. So, uh, what we use is we send the optical pulses, as I told you, and this uh, determines the, we call it spatial resolution of our receivers. So roughly we use like 10 nanosecond pulse and this produce one meter spatial resolution, which means you can divide the optical fibers to point sensors separated by one meter uh, distance. And you can distinguish the acoustic events that happens along the entire optical fibers by this one meter distance. And um, as I mentioned, uh, for example, we in a, an experiment we were like trying to detect the red palm weevil, and just watering happens in the field, so directly we can identify the location where is that is happening because this all the entire farm is appearing on our uh, screen. So and regarding the more I mean the specifications and the hardware of the system, so we build it all here at Coast from scratch, uh, including the signal processing machine learning, all of these have been developed here at Kaos. So if you are interested, of course, I will be more than happy to describe all of the details to you. Sure. Thank you. What currently, what currently limits the length? The length because uh, in communication, you know, there is like attenuation for the signals that you sent uh, 0.1 dB per, uh, per kilometer. So we send the pulse, but we get scattering, something named Rayleigh scattering. Rayleigh really scattering is a very weak signal. So if we increase the length beyond 10 kilometers, the signal will be very attenuated and our photo detector would not be able to detect it with high signal to noise ratio value. So this is the limit. We would like to take the last question, then we close. Um, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. My name is Dr. Abiy Salemi. Actually, my question is, in, um, uh, it's very far from technical, it is uh, more of a strategical question. You mentioned uh, smart uh, farming. Um, uh, look of uh, our vision 2030. What do you th uh, think from your opinion or, or are needed from your opinion from the policy makers towards uh, making this transformation uh, possible um, uh, to uh, affect the, 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 the uh, farm owners for this uh, new technology. Maybe I'd like to get uh, uh, Mr. Abdul Muniam's uh, comment. No. No. 
هناك كثير من المزارع الكبيرة محتاجين إلى هذه التقنية لإدارة مزارعهم رؤية عشرين ثلاثين نحاول أن نطور عمليات التقنيات الحديثة والذكاء الاصطناعي وإدخالها في مجال الزراعة خصوصا كبار المزارعين بحاجة لها فمثلا حاليا الآن الوزارة تحاول تتدرج في عملية الخدمة المزارع, المزارع الصغيرة تحاول تخدمها بالكامل المزارع التراوح نخيلها أكثر من ألف أو أقل من خمسة إلى ألف تعطيها بعض الخدمات المزارع الكبيرة يفترض أن تتولى جميع عمليات المكافحة ذاتيا فمزارع تصور فيها خمسين ألف أو بعض المزارع الراجحة ثلاثمية ألف هذا بحاجة إلى إلى تقنيات حديثة وأجهزة ذكاء اصطناعي لإدارة المزرعة بأقل تكاليف ممكنة.